We're wrapping up our first season, which focused on the work of pitch book writers and analysts. <clears throat> Man. You, this... <clears throat> you guys got me. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. All right. All right, Kai. Welcome to PitchBook's Invisible Capital Podcast, where we use data, research, and conversation to reveal important trends and issues in the private markets. Welcome, everyone, to the Invisible Capital Podcast. I'm Adam Lewis, a private equity reporter for the PitchBook Newsletter. I'm Hillary Wick, a senior analyst on the editorial team covering fund strategies and performance with a sideline in ESG and impact investing. And I'm Adley Bowden, head of our editorial and institutional research group. We're wrapping up our first season, which focused on the work of PitchBook writers and analysts during the COVID-19 pandemic. For me, the biggest takeaway was really just the resilience of the private markets. You know, as we all kind of zoom back to, well, Zoom's even an interesting word here, is that's taken on new meaning. But you go back to March and you look at the big downturn and you know, I think what we were all potentially looking at. And here we are, you know, nearly six months later and the private markets are chugging. And, you know, you see... Fund marks have you know really survived. Now the private markets are obviously attached to the public markets, but you know fund marks are still there. Deal activity is happening, funding's happening in Europe. You know so far the data doesn't even really show a blip. In fact, it shows growth in certain areas. So I've been pretty impressed as just analyst after analyst, you know, and writer after writer. We've we've really seen just a resilience in the private markets, and it's been interesting to hear that. And I think it's going to be interesting to see what happens over over the next six months. Yeah, the the podcast for me has been a delight in highlighting all the expertise that both exists and continues to form in the organization. I mean, none of us knew anything about COVID at the beginning of the year, but we've put out some remarkable work using data as well as just kind of knowing the industry and how the participants act. I joined the organization in January and had really no idea of the depth of the, the analytical work and the research work that we can do here. So it's been a delight to discover that through this podcast. Yeah, and then just to maybe echo Adley's comments a little bit, my biggest takeaway has just been the overall resilience of the private equity industry through all of this. Um, I'll never forget back in March, Bill Ackman, this famous hedge fund manager who's raising a SPAC uh, to acquire unicorns, but he he basically said on CNBC that he thought the whole private equity industry could go under. And uh, was obviously very wrong. Um, we've seen Apollo Global make a series of huge pipe deals that have that have all fared really well. Blackstone has been as active as ever, uh, acquiring Ancestry.com. They're set to take Bumble public here in a few months. You know, private equities they're they're getting more access to our 401k. They're 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 still everywhere, and the industry's expertise is positioned uh, to you know take advantage of these market downturns. So. Private equity isn't going anywhere. That's that's my takeaway from season one. Yeah, it seems like, and some of the P firms have said this, that you know it was a signal for them to get more aggressive. Silver Lake with Airbnb, and now that's talking an IPO. Uh, Expedia. So there's there's been some very non-traditional, very innovative and interesting approaches taken by the largest private equity firms. And then you know the middle market private equity firms have been hunting value and deals as well. But to go back, I mean, even just to the idea that Ackman, the hedge fund manager, raising a, a SPAC to chase <laughs> right. unicorns or to go unicorn dating, is I think he's calling it right now. I mean, which it's honestly, just, when that when that came out, half of us had to go to the internet and figure out what a SPAC was. So yeah, and, and now simpler time. Flash simpler forward times. six months later, and that's all anybody's talking about. I mean, it's it's pretty crazy what has happened over the last six months in what's kind of a niche arcane area of, of finance to, in, in some respects, but it is, it is active and it is, you know, changing right before our eyes. Yeah. And actually going up a level to people putting money into private equity, it's been interesting to watch in that the big players who Adam named a number of them have been getting most of the money. So it'll be interesting to see how the middle market and the smaller market funds can do if, you know, they can't get out and fundraise maybe as easily as they used to, and they can't right. attract the attention that, you know, Blackstone doesn't even have to raise a finger and they pull in billions of dollars for every right. fund they raise. Well, now they can just raise a SPAC, right? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> if, if they're struggling to pull in fundraising, because that frenzy doesn't appear to be stopping anytime soon, from what I can tell. Yeah, the long-term structural implications of you know what we've seen over the last six months will will certainly be interesting, 
you know, when the performance shakes out and, you know, deals done before the, the recession done after done during who's active, which sectors, you know, energy obviously took a huge, huge hit yeah. continues to struggle. Um, there's a lot of funds that focused in there that you know, are going to really take this one on the chin. So it's well, not all roses. I was yeah. going to say, and not to be a Debbie Downer, but, you know, this COVID thing's not over yet. Winter's coming, and that's when oftentimes these viruses get worse. So hopefully, knock wood, we are in a better place than we were in March when we didn't know it was coming at us. But a lot of money that went to work this year may still be at risk. Yeah, that Exxon Mobil stock I got for my bar mitzvah 17 <laughs> years ago isn't isn't looking too hot right now. <laughs> But it's been paying Grandma. you a good dividend for a long time now. Yeah, sweet dividends for a couple couple decades. But it's all right. The Zoom I didn't buy in January is performing very well. Um, <laughs> although the the Snowflake IPO, you know, is making that look like cheap. Yeah. So if I take out a second rethink. mortgage, maybe I can buy one share by the end of yeah. the day. But let's talk. Let's talk Robinwood <laughs> options if we really want to get. There we and, go. And none of this should be considered investment advice. No. No. Once again, we're. I have to put that disclaimer at the end of the show. But <laughs> um, well, we will obviously hope to discuss all of this in our upcoming seasons. Thanks again for listening to the Invisible Capital podcast. We eclipsed 35,000 downloads this season, and obviously that couldn't have been possible without our great listeners. You can find show notes and more information at pitchbook.com slash podcast. And also please consider reading and reviewing the show to help others discover it. Plus, we'd love to get your feedback directly if you want to write to us at podcasts at pitchbook.com. Stay tuned for season two later this fall which will take a look at how emerging technologies are shaping how we live and work during the pandemic and what life might look like after, whenever after is, just hopefully soon. Thank you again to all of our listeners for listening to this season of PitchBook's Invisible Capital Podcast. Invisible Capital.